Hey friends, welcome to Midweek, and I'm so glad you're joining with us tonight. We're going to get straight into it. And so a few weeks ago, we started this little mini-series called The Encounter. And what we're doing is we're walking through different characters that Jesus has encountered along the last few moments of his life. The first week, we talked about the disciples and how they were having one more supper, the last supper with Jesus in the upper room as they were celebrating Passover. And Jesus was essentially saying, this is it. And he goes and he washes their feet and he treats them as, a, as the guest of honor, if you will. And then Peter, the next week, we talked about him and how his overconfident faith led to a distracted prayer life, which led to him following Jesus from a distance. And if you and I aren't careful, we fall into that trap all the time. And then last week, we talked about the biggest villain in the Bible, in fact, probably the world, and that is Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. And what we did is we connected the dots with Judas to our own life and how there's a lot of Judas in us as well. And so tonight, we're going to talk about another disciple who is a heavy hitter as far as the disciples go, and it's the Apostle John. And so what John is, he's incredible in many ways. For one, he's the only um, disciple who got to retire. The rest of them were martyred for their faith. He he was retired at, at the island of Patmos, which isn't a glorious retirement because he was lonely. But nonetheless, he was the one that got to die of old age. Jesus revealed to him how it all comes together and how everything's going to end. And we get the book of Revelation from that. And so John wrote the gospel. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. So he has a big influence in the Christian church. I mean, the guy is huge. And so another great thing about John is that he is the one that Jesus loved. Now, he says that himself. The other disciples, they'll tell you that. And it's not that Jesus didn't love the other disciples, but he had a really close relationship with John. And John gives us an inside view of what it's like to be on the inner circle of Jesus. Because anytime Jesus would have to only take a few of his disciples' places, John was one of those. Peter, James, and John. And so John, the way he writes in his gospel, pretty much tells you and I how we can have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. He talks about the intimacy that comes behind having a relationship with Jesus. And if you read all the gospels, you're going to see each one of them have their own theme and their own outline. But John really talks about the way you and I connect. And when we read his gospel, it's like reading an autobiography of where John is looking back at his life because he's a reflective writer. So he's years later past the events of Jesus and he's thinking about them over and over in his mind. And as he starts to write them down, all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and this is what Jesus meant by this. And he tells about seven miracles through the gospel of John that really indicate different levels of discipleship. And the first one is Jesus turning water into wine. Now, when Jesus did this, you may be thinking, well, what does that have to do with discipleship? Well, think about it deeper, right? When you and I get baptized, what's the next step that we go to? It's the communion table. We go straight from the water, straight to the wine. And you see how this is all connected? And every miracle that Jesus performs through the Gospel of John that he tells about is that aha moment about how this connects to an intimate relationship with Jesus. But tonight I want to tell you a specific miracle that Jesus does. And it's the third one that we talk about in John. And it comes from John chapter 5. And in this chapter, Jesus is dealing with some incredible things. And so I'll just start reading. It comes from John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. And here it goes. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Now there's, now there in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic, Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and one who's been laying there has been there for 38 years. Let's talk about this for a second. This talks about this pool that's there called Bethesda, right? This pool is a special pool, which you probably already started asking your questions. Why are all the broken people going there? Why are all the ones who are sick going there. Well, there's this, there, there's this kind of this uh, fable that is being told around the land at this time that this pool is special because God would send an angel down to stir up the water. And if you were the first person in the pool after the angel had stirred the water, so when they see any movement in the water, people would just run in and dive in hoping to be that first one because the fable tells, the story tells, is that if you were the first one in there, you would be healed. And so this guy is all of a sudden going there for 38 years. He is laying there hoping that he will be the first one to dive in when he sees the water moving. And so let me ask you this question. It's a little bit deep. 
But when, when is enough? When do you find yourself at a level of hopelessness? I mean, I, I have to ask myself that question all the time. Have you ever been in a situation where your faith, you, you believe in Jesus, but you're really not sure how much he loves you, and so you kind of question everything, but yet you've been told in the church that Jesus loves those who love themselves, Jesus helps those who help themselves, and all this stuff. But guess what? That's never actually written in the Bible anywhere, right? And so we see a bunch of these broken people coming to this pool, hoping that they will find freedom, hoping that they will find healing by being the first one into the water. So I imagine as this guy was a teenager, as he started to grow up, he always had this hope that something would be different, that I'll get there, I'll get in the pool. And so for 38 years, this guy is laying next to there. So we don't really know how old he is, but we know for at least 38 years, he's been trying to get in. But at some point, I think he became hopeless. Right? When you start to realize, okay, things are never going to change, you give up trying to change that. Right? I mean, look at weight loss, for instance. I've been struggling with that my whole life. And almost every year I tell myself, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to lose weight. And as I get older and as things get closer, all of a sudden it's, it's discouraging because I don't see the fruits of my labor. And sometimes we end up giving up. Right? Look at your New Year's resolutions. Are you still doing those? Or have you become hopeless with that thinking, well, I'm back to square one. You see what I mean? And so when Jesus finds this guy laying here, it says for 38 years, he poses a question when he sees them. And this question really, really hits me. It comes from verse 6 at the end. Jesus saw him in his condition, and he asked them, do you want to get well? Man, what a deep question that is. Now, you may be reading this and asking yourself, why would Jesus even ask a question like that? Obviously, that guy is sitting by the water so that he can be well. He just can't get in there because he's paralyzed, right? He's invalid, the Bible says. And so he can't really move. And so as he's trying to crawl into the water, people are already running there and getting ahead of him. But I'm wondering if maybe he's there, not so much for the water anymore, but because he's used to the attention that he gets when he's in there. There may be people, uh, tons of beggars at this place, and people are coming and throwing coins at a pity. You've seen homeless people, how they go up there and they panhandle. They may be playing the guitar and uh, they're asking for money. You don't, you know, you don't give them a lot, but you may throw in a couple quarters. You may throw in a couple dollars, which isn't much to you, but hey, to them, it's something. And so he's just gotten so used to this attention that maybe he's just there because he wants the money. He wants the attention. And I'll be honest, there's moments in my life where I was sick. And uh, I enjoy the attention that my wife may give me or that the kids give me or that they wait on me hand and foot when they know I'm not feeling well. And sometimes we get so used to that attention that the hopelessness of trying to get better starts to fade away because we realize that this, this is okay. And so when Jesus comes and approaches this man, he says, do you even want to get well? Man, that's a deep question. And of course he does. And Jesus says, well, you don't need to wait for the angel. I mean, this is me talking now, but he says, you don't have to wait for the angel to come stir up the water. Go get up and walk. Take your mat, go home. And he does. And all of a sudden now the Pharisees are involved and they're wanting to figure out who in the world healed him on the Sabbath and all this other stuff. And so then Jesus finds him at the temple and he goes and he tells him this. I don't, I don't want to misquote it. So he says today, so verse 12, he says, so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. And in verse 14, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See that you are, you are well again. Now stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Man, go and stop sinning. That's a deep question, isn't it? This story really unpacks in a lot of ways, because as we're leading up to Easter Sunday, which is all this, what all this is about, you and I presented with that question. Do you even want to get well? Now think about that on a spiritual level, because as Jesus went to the cross, this is where it all ties into the Easter story. As Jesus went into the cross, he gave his life for you. And I just imagine in that moment that he's looking right at me and he's saying, Brandon, I see you there. I see that you're hurting. I see your pain and I see that you've gone hopeless. But I need to ask you this. Are you even wanting to be better? Are you wanting to be healed? of the pain, of the misery, of living life the way that you've wanted to for so many years and trying to do everything on your own and realizing that you are your own God and now you've come to me broken and hopeless, but are you really wanting to get well? Because following me is going to rock your world. And then Jesus, Jesus looks at us from the cross. <laughs> and I wonder if he tells us the same thing. Now go and sin no more. 
because what I've done for you is enough. And if you keep living outside of the boundaries that I'm asking you to live within, which isn't that difficult, just love people, love God. And if you go on living outside those boundaries, worse things could happen. So go and be well. That's Jesus on the cross. And as John is writing this story in a reflective manner, he is putting these details in there for a reason. We know that this guy's been there for 38 years. John tells us that, right? So for most of his life, this guy is really struggling. And Jesus says, do you even want to be well? Or are you so used to being hopeless that that's the new comfort for you? So let me ask you this. Do you really want Jesus to be a part of your life? Or are you only in it for the benefits that you've heard other people talk about? Are you in it for the blessing that other people talk about? Are you only into following Jesus because of what he can do for you, not because of the intimate relationship that John is trying to introduce you to? Because every time I come to the communion table, every time I celebrate Easter, it's this reminder that Jesus is looking at me eyeball to eyeball and saying, Brandon, do you even want to be better? Because if you do, follow me. And that path will lead to great things. The road's not always easy, but it leads to great things. Friends, I want to ask you that question too. Do you want to be better? Do you even want to be healed? Or do you get so used to living in a life of hopelessness that it's just beyond compare? I promise you a life of Jesus is worthwhile. Now I'm going to challenge you to read the rest of the Gospel of John. Start from the beginning. Find these miracles that he does and see how it connects to walking with him in discipleship, walking with Jesus in discipleship. And I promise you, the Gospel of John can change your life if you read it. The Gospel of John can change your life as you get into an intimate relationship with the creator of the universe, the I am, Jesus himself. Friends, I hope you have a great week and we look forward to seeing you next time.